Welcome again, brothers and sisters. This is Blake with Defending Zion, and today I wanted to talk about the law of the gospel. Uh, this is a phrase that we hear in the temple, and it's something we read about in scriptures, but do we truly understand what the law of the gospel is? So hopefully you'll uh, learn some things that will help you to draw closer to Christ through this uh, presentation. Um, first, we need to talk, though, about law, and why is law important? Um, in Alma 42, 17 through 21, we learn this. Now, how could a man repent except he should sin? How could he sin if there was no law? How could there be a law save there was a punishment? Now, there was a punishment affixed and a just law given, which brought remorse of conscience unto man. Now, if there was no law given, if a man murdered, he should die. Would he be afraid he would die if he should murder? And also, if there was no law given against sin, men would not be afraid to sin. And if there was no law given, if men sinned, what could justice do? Or mercy either, for they would have no claim upon the creature. So from the scripture we learn that justice and mercy can only operate when a law is in place and when that law is enforced. We also learn that um, in the Doctrine and Covenants that justice and mercy are governed by law. In DNC 8835 we read, That which breaketh a law, and abideth not by law, but seeketh to become a law unto itself, and willeth to abide in sin, and altogether abideth in sin, cannot be sanctified by law, neither by mercy, justice, nor judgment. Therefore they must remain filthy still. We also know that there are certain laws that govern kingdoms. And we read that all kingdoms have a law given, and there are many kingdoms, for there is no space in the which there is no kingdom, and there is no kingdom in which there is no space, either a greater or a lesser kingdom. And unto every kingdom is given a law, and unto every law there are certain bounds also and conditions. So, um, you know, when we apply this to like, you know, the terrestrial kingdom or telestial kingdom or celestial kingdom, we know that each of those kingdoms have laws and that the laws are, are the things that help to govern those kingdoms to, you know, provide order and structure. So when we're looking at all these different laws and all these different kingdoms, what is the law that should be our aim? Well, in section 88, we also read that they who are not sanctified through the law which I have given unto you, even the law of Christ must inherit another kingdom, even that of a terrestrial kingdom, or that of a telestial kingdom. For he who is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. And in DNC 105.5 we read, And Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. So, from these scriptures, we learn that there's, you know, this law of Christ, which is also called the law of the celestial kingdom, which is also the law of Zion. These are all the laws that we have been commanded to follow. So, when you're searching through the scriptures, when you see these phrases, law, the law of Christ, the law of the celestial kingdom, the law of the gospel, or the law of Zion. These all mean the same thing. These are all the same law. It's not separate laws. It's all the law, same law. Now we also know that this law of the gospel is to be taught among the saints. And going back to DNC 88, 77 through 78, we learn that I give unto you a commandment that you shall teach one another the doctrine of the kingdom. Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you, that you may be instructed more perfectly in theory, in principle, in doctrine, in the law of the gospel, in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God, that are expedient for you to understand. So this scripture here well, was revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith um, towards the end of 1832 or at the beginning of 1833. And from the scripture, we learn that the law of the gospel has already been given. And this makes sense, right? Because how could the Lord command them to teach 
the law of the gospel if they hadn't already been given it. So that's an important clue for us to understand what the law of the gospel is. It's something that was already revealed prior to 1832, beginning of 1833. And as we look at the scriptures, we can see that the specific requirements of this law, the law of the celestial kingdom, the law of Christ, the law of the gospel, and the law of Zion are actually in the scriptures. And uh, you're going to find that primarily in Doctrine and Covenants section 42, DNC 88, and DNC 136 verse 23. So let's review what this law is. First we read, Thou shalt not kill. And he that kills shall not have forgiveness in this world, nor in the world to come. And again I say, Thou shalt not kill, but he that killeth shall die. DNC 42.20 Thou shalt not steal, and he that stealeth and will not repent shall be cast out. DNC 42.21 Thou shalt not lie, he that lieth and will not repent shall be cast out. DNC 42.22 and 23 Thou shalt love thy wife, and for, for women, thou shalt love thy husband with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto her, or him, and none else. And he, or she, that looketh upon a woman, or a man, to lust after, shall deny the faith, and shall not have the spirit. And if he repents not, he shall be cast out. So it's important to understand that um, this specific part of the law of the gospel about loving our spouse, it presupposes a celestial marriage relationship. So we know that the celestial marriage is also a part of this law. In DNC 42, 24 through 26, thou shalt not commit adultery, and he that committeth adultery and repenteth not shall be cast out. But he that has committed adultery and repents with all his heart and forsaketh it and doeth it no more, thou shalt forgive. But if he doeth it again, he shall not be forgiven, but shall be cast out. DNC 42.27 Thou shalt not speak evil of thy neighbor, nor do him any harm. DNC 42.30 And behold, thou wilt remember the poor, and consecrate of thy properties for their support, that which thou hast to impart unto them, with a covenant and a deed which cannot be broken. So we learn here that the law of consecration is actually a subpart of the law of the gospel. And I am going to have a separate presentation where I'm going to actually discuss what the law of consecration and stewardship is. So be on the lookout for that. DNC 4240. Thou shalt not be proud in thy heart. Let all thy garments be plain, and their beauty, the beauty of the work of thine own hands. DNC 4241. And let all things be done in cleanliness before me. Um, if you noticed when President Nelson uh, revealed the revised Temple Recommend questions, this is something that was added to those uh, Recommend questions, um, which I think is important. So, if you know, the Temple Recommend questions are designed to help us to live the law of the gospel. DNC 4242 Thou shalt not be idle. For he that is idle shall not eat the bread, nor wear the garments of the laborer. laborer. DNC 4245. Thou shalt live together in love, insomuch that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die, and more especially for those that have not hope of a glorious resurrection. DNC 4253. Thou shalt stand in the place of thy stewardship. So again, this is an allusion to the law of consecration and stewardship. DNC 4254, Thou shalt not take thy brother's garment. Thou shalt pay for that which thou shalt receive of thy brother. Again, this is another part of the law of consecration. DNC 4255, If thou obtainest more than that which would be for thy support, thou shalt give it into my storehouse. And again, this is part of the law of consecration. DNC 4256, Thou shalt ask and my scriptures shall be given as I have appointed. Here, this is uh, specifically referencing the sealed portion of the gold plates. So part of the law of the gospel in living that is asking for additional scripture to be given. DNC 
DNC 4258. I give unto you a commandment that then ye shall teach them. And when he says them, he's referencing the sealed portion of the gold plates. Ye shall teach them unto all men, for they shall be taught unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. It's important to understand as we look at the scriptures um, regarding the sealed portion of the gold plates, we know that the gold, these sealed portions won't come forth um, in the day of wickedness. And so it's incumbent and important for us to obey this law of the gospel, to be able to have those, those uh, revelations, to have that sealed portion. DNC 4288. And if thy brother or sister offend thee, thou shalt take him or her between him or her and thee alone. And if he or she confess, thou shalt be reconciled. DNC 8869. Cast away your idle thoughts and your excess of laughter far from you. DNC 88121. Therefore, cease from all your light speeches, from all laughter, from all your lustful desires, from all your pride and light mindedness, and from all your wicked doings. And finally, DNC 13623. Cease to contend one with another, cease to speak evil one of another. Now, I know that um, I mentioned earlier about celestial marriage um, being a, uh, an essential part of this law of the gospel. Um, and I think there's some questions that come up about what about plural marriage? Um, you know, there's people that, that believe that uh, plural marriage is something that must be part of uh, the restoration of the law of the gospel and, and of living the law of the celestial kingdom. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to really talk about that. I'm going to have some other separate presentations on uh, celestial marriage and plural marriage. Um, but I did find an interesting quote here from Brigham Young in the Journal of Discourses about uh, a, a time in the future, so in the future from when he was living. And he, he does mention something here uh, regarding plural marriage. So he says, quote, I suppose that more than half a million of the brave sons of our country now sleep in the dust in consequence of what I consider an unnecessary war, the Civil War. And the end is not yet. They have left their wives and daughters unprotected in a land rent asunder with a fratricidal war. And what are to become of them? You remember the scripture which reads, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. He may say in the latter times, Now, my sons, take unto yourselves wives of the daughters of men, and raise up a posterity unto me, and teach them the way of life and salvation, and the arts of peace, that they may war no more forever. End quote. So here, it seems like Brigham Young is alluding to a time in the future uh, when there will be uh, an unnecessary war, a great war, that will leave many wives and daughters without fathers and husbands. And what's to become of those? Uh, for those that choose to, to join Zion, for those that choose to let God prevail, and who choose to become part of Israel, what's to happen to them? Well, Brigham Young... Um, postulates that, you know, the Lord may command that the sons of God, meaning those who are in Zion, will take unto themselves wives of these daughters of men who join themselves with Zion. Um, now, what, he's not explicitly stating that this is going to be a uh, plural marriage type of scenario. It could be. Or it could be that there will be, you know, perhaps righteous single brothers in Zion that will not have wives and, you know, that, that they will marry these daughters of men who have joined themselves with Zion. Not really sure, but that's just kind of what uh, Brigham Young said on the subject. Um, something interesting to think about. So as we think about building Zion, especially as that becomes more relevant in the future, the law of the gospel, the law of Zion is going to become essential. And I testify that the Lord has revealed that law to us, that we can know what it is and we can and we should be obedient to it if we hope to be able to, to welcome Christ back to the earth 
He needs to have a Zion people before he comes back again. And the way that he does that is by the love of the gospel. And I bear testimony of that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.